Good morning, everyone. This is Doug. This will be an episode on canon, which is really the core issue of the Jesus Words Only channel, because we're saying Jesus Words are the only canon, the apostolic canon, that would be the four Gospels and then, of course, the book of Revelation. But other than that, it's letters which don't count, and they're not quoting Jesus, any of the letters, even James, Peter, Paul never quotes Jesus except the the uh, baptism, not baptism, the uh, formula for communion, which anybody would know if you were at all involved with Christianity, even the lay people could repeat that. So that's it. That's all we have in the epistles. So wh who has the main authority? Well, the 12 had said it was the, the gospels. Okay. So that would be, it started with Matthew and John, we'll see. And then Luke was in third position and Mark was in fourth position. Okay. And there's reasons for all these things, but we'll get into that as we go. So other than that, apostolic, Jesus words, only New Testament canon of the 12. Okay. Other than that, which was confirmed by both Karlstadt in the 1520s and then Metzger in the 1990s, that was the canon. It was what Jesus said. Those were the only words that were on par with the law and prophets. No Paul, no Peter, no James. These were secondary authorities that had edifying qualifications, potentially, and had to be tested and all that. Other than those, that principle of the New Testament canon in the earliest church, was there any canon that ever came later that was binding on anything more than one city? Absolutely not. You have been misled, and I'm going to show you how it's carefully crafted in the word crafting to make you think there was a canon for the entire church and all that. If you study Roman Catholic doctrine, they'll tell you the canon was first decided when? After the Reformation of the Protestants, 1547. So I'm putting that to one side because I, I'm in the Protestant line. We don't acknowledge anything the Catholics do in response to us to try to tell us what we have to believe. And that's what they were doing, trying to say, oh, well, we've never really made a decision about canon. Finally, we'll get to it. And this is binding on you, you Protestants so that you can't reform away from us. OK, that was the whole point of finally getting to make a decision that would be binding on the entire church. But that never happened before. And I will get into that now. Now, one of the first things that we're never told in any of these articles you read at Wikipedia or all these other things, and I think they're generally just not uh, familiar enough, but there was a famous book by a scholarly guy named Photius, and he had a library of materials. And in there, if you read it, uh, this is by J.H. Friese from a, a book from 1920 from the Society for Prom Promoting Christian Knowledge, London, so on, so on, the Macmillan Company. And here's what you're going to learn. I'm just going to read you the ruling. The Council of Nicaea of 325 ruled that no bishop shall exercise jurisdiction beyond his own province. So nobody could make a council decision uh, by themselves in one city, and then that would be binding outside of that city. So Hippo, for example, was in Algeria, which is what most Protestants are told. That was the decision by the church, not telling you it was a city, a bisphoric, a small town in the middle of Africa. That that wasn't intended to be binding on everybody. It was by the city because that was the rules of 325. That was the rules. Nobody who, no bishop could rule outside his jurisdiction. And there was no Roman bishop who was ahead of everybody. That was the agreement between, between the Christian bishops. Nobody would be head over head above anyone else. We we're all equal. We all have equal votes. Okay. And I just want to read you. Uh, page 185. Now, this is a he's just talking about another John. It's not material who it was, it wasn't our apostle. Informed Theophilus of the charges against him, to which Theophilus angrily replied, quote, I believe you are acquainted with the canons of the Council of Nicaea, by which it is ordained that no bishop shall exercise jurisdiction beyond his own province. If you are not, then make yourself acquainted with them and do not interfere with the charges against me. End of quote. So, this is something that we are normally not told is the Council of Nicaea. And, and actually, you can see it in the very sense that people were voting. It, it, the Bishop of Rome didn't even show up for the Council of Nicaea, and it's still a decision was made that was binding of allegedly for, at Nicaea on everybody because he was invited, but he had bad legs. He couldn't make it, and that was probably a deliberate scheme by Constantine to make sure the Bishop of Rome couldn't be present for what was going to happen, a radical change in the Christian Christianity of Christ to something totally opposite from what he believed. But anyway, that's all another thing. John 17, 1 to 3, if you think I'm <laughs> wrong, Jesus didn't believe in what happened in that conference. But anyway, but the point is this, that conference of 325 was one vote for one man. Everybody, everybody who was a bishop got one vote and their votes counted equally. 
There was no one bishop who was over the others. Do you see the point? It was already built into the framework of that council that that had to be equally done. Therefore, it could be binding on everybody who agreed to it in their when they went back home to their bishop, this forks. Most of them were bishops leading their congregations, uh, the person in charge of the administration of a church area. So that you can just see it's baked into the very way the vote took place. Now, as I said, the, there was a agreement between Metzger in the 1990s with a man many centuries earlier, Andreas Karlstadt, who died in 1541. He was a co-founder of the Reformation with Luther. Luther was his pupil. Luther is the person he educated in Greek studies and theology and all of that. And then when uh, Costa came out with this book, <laughs> he wasn't happy. He, uh, Luther was not happy with him. We'll get into that in a second. Anyway, uh, well, he wasn't fa happy for this quote. This, this is uh, uh, Karlstadt. The spirit of the apostles is not a guide equal or greater than the Lord. Thus, Paul, within his letters, does not have as much authority as has Christ. That's exactly what Metzger found out. The apostles didn't believe their letters were uh, holy scripture. They were writings, and fine maybe, but they're not on par with Jesus. And that's the whole point. And that was the point of Karlstadt. And that's the point of Metzger telling you the very same thing. Okay. And we're going to play a clip from a video I recently did on Metzger, just my reading the Metzger portion of his uh, book that you can get online, by the way, at uh, Amazon. But let's go on. So the best historian of the apostolic canon is confirmed by Metzger. So that's what I'm going to read you what he, Karlstadt said. Now, you've seen this probably at the end of many of my clips so far, but let's read it again. The spirit of the apostles is not a guide equal or greater than the Lord. So if an apostle Peter wrote something, is it equal to Jesus? No. Is it greater than Jesus? Of course not. Jesus in John 13, 16 said, the apostle is not greater than the one who sent him. That word apostle is hidden from you in most translations. Only three of the 31 translations at the, King, at the Bible have, will tell you the word apostle is there. It'll, it'll change apostle, which is a noun, into a verb, he who is sent. No, it says that the apostles are not greater than the ones who sent him. And Carl Stott knew that, but you don't know that. So now you know it. Now you know why he's saying this. It's totally true. Then he says, thus Paul within his letters does not have as much authority as has Christ. Yes, that's what Christ said in John 13, 16. Verses, John 13, verse 16. Take a look at it. Anyway, Carl Stott wrote this in his book, Canonicis Scripturis 1520. He was a co-founder of the Reformation. And I have the book. I'm, I'm going to show you crops from it in a second. Uh, this was published by Credner, and this is section 161 of that book. Now let's take a look at it. Here's the title page, 1847, Dr. Carl August Credner. And here's the book. It begins at page 291, goes to 412, and let's follow up. Now, just so you know, is if you follow that message that I just read you and quoted you, which is from John 13, 16, right? It's based on the Jesus' words that you can't have of an apostle who's greater than his master. And this, this is what uh, Beard, who wrote a book on uh, Karlstadt, said, plainly the adoption of Karlstadt's principle would have made it impossible for the reformer, Luther, to embrace a Pauline theology, except under the condition of finding it in the books of the first and greatest authority, the Gospels themselves. And guess what happened to the relationship between Luther and Karlstadt? Even though they had been partners for three years, even though while Luther was in hiding from 1517 to 1520 when he gave that speech at the Diet of Worms, Costa was leading and leading, basically hundreds of thousands of people were flocking to him. Luther was nobody hiding in a castle in Thurbingen. Thurbingen I hope I got that right. And and Costa is so famous. And this book is what he comes out with. It, Luther was furious and wrote a book calling him the new Judas, just so you know. Kicked him out. <laughs> had, had the city council of Württemberg, which mostly Catholic, kick uh, the Catholic he had, uh, Karstadt had been a Catholic priest, but defrocked himself. So he would give, it's basically say the Catholic church has no more authority. And so Catholic church is very happy to follow Luther. You want me to kick, you, you want us to kick him out of uh, Wittenberg? No problem. We're going to send him packing. And he sent him uh, uh, basically to live penniless for a few years, but eventually he found a way to live on his uh, a farm. And then he eventually got to Basel, Switzerland, became a professor of theology, but that's a whole nother story. Now, I want to show you something. This is his order of books. So these are the four books he believes should be in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just the way we have it today. But he drops Acts. Hmm, that's interesting. 
And then he says in the third position, I'm going to show you the middle position in a second. He has uh, Hebrews, Jacob, which is uh, James's real name is Jacob, by the way. But who knows? In the King James Bible, he turned it to James. Who knows why? Peter, Second Peter, and then uh, the uh, the Presbyter. I'm not sure what that is. I'll, I'll look that up. Do I Sonoris, the one of Jude. Oh, I think some people believe that one of John's epistles was written by John the Presbyter, not by John the Apostle, but that's that must be one of his conclusions. And then one epistle of Jude and, of course, the Apocalypse. But he again drops Acts here. Hmm, let's keep going. Okay, so now in second position are all of the epistles of, of uh, Romans. Then you get to see Peter in his first epistle and the first one of John. Obviously, he doesn't credit the ep epistles after First John is in the same category, and that's what he meant by the presbyter, this presbyter signore. And I think he gets rid of uh, one of John's epistles altogether. Uh, but anyway, so what's, what am I trying to show you here is Acts is dropped in all three groups, and that's all, the, all there is, okay? All right, well, let's verify, did he really get rid of the book of Acts in his opinion? Acts of Mission is explained by the editor Credner in his 1847 book. And this is a footnote he put to this. In the Latin work, the Acts of the Apostles is not named in the classification. I just showed you it's not named in any of the three classifications. Now, I, actually, I should point this out, first of all. This, is, this footnote here is in the book called An Introduction to the New Testament, Volume 2, by Frederick Bleek and Johannes Frederick Bleek, page 274. They're commenting on... Uh, the work of Karlstadt, and then they're noticing that the Book of Acts is not mentioned, and then they say uh, that Karlstadt reckoned it with the Gospel of St. Luke as appears in page 396, editor Credner. Now, they're making you think Credner was saying the Book of Acts was intended to be somewhere, <laughs> or is when John, uh, Luke mentions, when Luke is mentioned to be the writer of the Gospel, that meant it was inclusive of the Book of Acts. You will see that's not true. Here's what it actually says on that page, this this page 396 of Credner, and this is the words of Karlstadt. And I, I, I could read the Latin to you, but you won't know what it says. So I translated it. He uh, composed the Acts, Luke composed the Acts of the Apostles as he had seen and wrote the gospel as he indeed had heard. That doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't tell me that when I hear the word uh, Luke's, gospel, Evangelio in, in uh, Latin, I'm supposed to read into that it means the book of Acts? No, I think he deliberately drops it. I think we need to realize that the book of Acts, while very useful for historical purposes, it tells us the ascension, it tells us who picked, uh, Jesus picked the 12, 12 apostles replaced Judas, a lot of other things. It basically gives us a lot of material to assess Paul's validity or not. And, but that is, not making it an inspired work. It's a historical work. And if you take an historical work and you put it into a, a, and also we now know or can infer it was a brief used in appellate proceeding where Paul at the end of the book of Acts has, uh, you see the last action happens is Paul has made an appeal in Acts 22, I think it is, to Caesar. And, or actually I think it's Acts 23 in front of Festus. He says, I wanna appeal to Caesar. And then by the end of Acts, they're, they're still waiting. And in historical terms, we know it's another two years before there's a hearing of the appeal to Nero, Caesar, as Paul had demanded. And so that was on the charge that Paul had brought in Trophimus, his friend from Ephesus, into the Holy Temple in an uncircumcised state and defiled the temple. And now he's going on trial for that or appeal for that. So that's what that's all about. And that's really means the purpose and writing of the book of Acts is not intended for Christians at all. I mean, it extols principles that are absolutely contrary to the word of God. For example, where Paul says, uh, God does not dwell in temples made of human hands. Well, Jesus said, you don't swear by the temple where God dwells in a temple. He, Jesus then actually says was made by human hands. <laughs> the same words that Paul says, God doesn't dwell in temples made of human hands. That's in Acts 17, if you don't know what I'm talking about. So why would, Paul, why would Luke have included these things to appeal to pagans? Pagans don't believe they're Olympus gods live in temples made of human hands. They visit, but they're never dwelling there. They don't stay in the temples. When when the temple door closes in a pagan culture, there's no god left in the, in the in the temple. You just go on. Okay, that's that's how it works. Or they may be a priestess who hangs out, or a priest, but the god isn't dwelling there. Their god dwells on Mount Olympus, even in Roman or uh, 
uh, Greek culture, there was this mountain where they would go or Elysian fields or whatever it was, but they don't dwell in temples made of human hands. That's the, just the bottom line. But God, Yahweh, he does dwell in temples made of human hands. So even says Jesus. And of course, the Jewish people believe the same thing. So that's why you can't believe the book of Acts was ever intended for Christians. We would be repulsed by what was what Paul is saying if if we were thought to meant to believe what we're hearing he him saying. But there's so many important other things that we need to keep I believe it's an historical work of very great value for us. So I would always include it, but I would always make a preface that says this is an historical work used for a certain purpose. You need to know the context. It was a for a pellet brief. You can't take these things as if Luke is endorsing Paul or endorsing that the God does not dwell in temples many human hands. All these things are meant to win an appeal brief. So bear it in mind. That's what that's the preface I would put in there. I think that's what Carl Stutt was doing here as well. And the authors of uh, Bleak and Bleak, they were trying to discount it and trying to make it sound like there's something here. To, to, there's some wonderful answer that uh, uh, there's something that Carl Stutt said that would indicate the book of Acts is included in Luke's gospel. I don't think so. It's not part of his gospel. It's a book that uh, amends his, uh, not amends, but continues the uh, a new volume, a new book. He's uh, begins in the book of Acts, as I've written you my prior book, blah, 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 blah. So that does not make them one book. It makes them two books, each being, a, one is sequel to the other. That's all it was. So I disagree with these men. And I do agree with Carl that this is the way you should look at it. Only have what's truly inspired, put that at the top of the list. That has to be the four gospels, at least. And then the book of Revelation is sort of an interesting, scary book. So, but I believe it's the word of God and he does too, but he would put in the the next category. So now let's look at something else here I want you to see. All right, now I'm going to show you in a few minutes, John MacArthur teaches in this book here, Biblical Doctrine, a Systematic Summary of the Bible, Truth, Wheaton, Crossway, 2017, at these pages. He's going to teach you that the origin of the canon came out of a decision in Hippo in, uh, let me see, here, here it is, in Hippo in 393 AD, and that has been a decision binding on all of us. And also he claims Athanasius gave us a decision in a festal letter of 365, what was canon. All of that is false. <laughs> Not that they, these, these men didn't do something in the, in, towards canon, but they can't bind anybody because why? Council of Nicaea ruled that no bishop shall exercise jurisdiction beyond his own province. So Athanasius can't do anything, right? He's in, from Egypt. Even if he was a bishop of Egypt, he got deposed five times. He got exiled five times. So he, he didn't hold his bishop position very long. So he's not binding on anybody but his own city of Alexandria while he's still bishop. Okay. And so there's nothing deci decided. And um, and then Hippo is in 393. Well, the Council of Hippo would have been run by Augustine of Hippo. He was a bishop there. And he, it's only binding on his city of, of Hippo. So it's, all of this is fraud on us to make us think, oh, my gosh, there's a decision for all of Christendom that went and happened early in the church. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Because you have to know this rule. No bishop shall exercise jurisdiction beyond his own province. That was decided in Nicaea in 325. And again, you can tell by the decision at Nicaea, it had to be each man, had a, each bishop had a single vote. Now, I think it'll be very helpful for us to understand how and why the books of James, Peter, Jude, and John were all put together and added to the four Gospels, okay? Why would that added? And we're going to see they were added first, and they were to come first, not Paul's. Paul was second. You got to understand how it originally was done, and we're going to review that here. Now, here's Athanasius' letter of 365 AD, just to give you a clue of what the original order really was. Now, he's going to say this. Again, it is not tedious to speak of the books of the New Testament. These are the four Gospels, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Afterwards, the Acts of the Apostles. So I, I think they were at that time thinking the Acts of the Apostles would help expose the problem that you're going to see that is, is amplified by the epistles that are going to come, come first. And the epistles, they're called Catholic or universal. Seven, that's James. One, of Peter. Two, of John. Three, after these, one of Jude. In addition, there are 14 epistles of Paul written in this order. Now, they're going to include Hebrews, by the way, I believe. Here he is, Hebrews. So that's not actually one of his. So he actually has 13. And Hebrews is probably written by Barnabas, just so you know. So I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not going to read all this stuff. And then lastly, blah, blah, blah. And besides the revelation of John, that the word of John is under there. So what am I showing you? James through uh, Jude are first after Jesus, okay? And 
that is for good reason. We're going to see. Um, now, I just want to tell you, can we, if you want to say we're bound by Athanasius, who was a bishop of, of Alexandria, Egypt, so he can only control his bisphoric, but we're going to allow him to control the world. Well, look what he believes. Uh, he, he believes that we should also have uh, the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of Sirach, Esther and Judas. Esther is in the Bible. Judas and Tobit. So we've got like four extra books. And uh, then he says, you, you can read the teaching of the apostles. That's the Didache. And the shepherd, but the and he explains here which you can read and it's inspired or not. But the former, my brethren, are included in the canon, meaning all these apocryphal works are canon. So he's actually can't be right, right? Because we've thrown the, the King James Bible removed all these book in, books in 1885 except Esther. We got rid of Judas. We got rid of Tobit. We got rid of Sarah. We got rid of the wisdom of Solomon. It's all gone. But it was there from the 1611 to 1885. Did you know that? 17 books removed from the uh, King James Bible. But did, did, was there a decision? I don't remember being consulted. Do you? Do you remember there was any big decision? No. It was done by the editors of the King James Bible. So you see, there's a lot going on that we're never even informed. What's really happening? Uh, okay. So the former is in canon. These Solomon, Sirach, Judas, Tobit, so on. And later, that is the teaching or the Didache and the shepherd, they're merely to be read, nor is there any place to mention of apocryphal writings and so on and so forth. All right, so let me prove to you who Ale uh, Athanasius of Alexandria was. He lived in Egypt. He was born in about 298, dies in 373. Uh, he was a Christian theologian. He had intermittent episcopacies, which means he was time and again, he was a bishop and then not a bishop. And he went in and out. Uh, over 17 uh, years, he had five exiles. And <laughs> so he was thrown out for not obeying Constantine or the next emperor, the next emperor. When he was replaced under the order of four different Roman emperors, <laughs> okay? Uh, but he was a noted Egyptian le Christian leader. So w w what does the Council of Nations say? say? Oh, no bishop shall exercise jurisdiction upon his own province. So nothing he does is binding on you or me or anybody but his own city of Alexandria, Egypt. Now I want to talk to you about the Council of Carthage of 397. This is another thing that MacArthur will point to, but again, it's just one single city. Let's listen to the summary of this in uh, the article, Councils of Carthage at Wikipedia, Synod of 397. The Council of Carthage, called the Third of Den by Denzinger, met on 28, 397. It reaffirmed the canons of Hippo from 393 and issued its own. And by the way, there's absolutely no records from the canon of Hippo, so that's why I'm skipping here. There's no documents to look at. It was just simply... This conference, because Augustine of Hippo went to this conference and he obviously chaired the Hippo conference in 393, this is the only one that has any records that gives you any reliable way of thinking that was even a list in 393, because all the records are 100% lost, okay? So <clears throat> one of these uh, decisions at uh, the council was, the, uh, at the third council, is recorded in the Codex Canonum Ecclesiae Africani, which presents a compilation of ordinances enacted by various church councils in Carthage during the fourth and fifth centuries. So that's exactly what you would expect from rulership that is based on what? Bisphorics, basically what city or you were a bishop over. You but those city archives of that municipality is a single bisphoric, and therefore it is appropriately keeping records of its own but it's not bound by any bishop in any other city. So everybody had the, the right to make their own decision. That was the ruling, the collegial ruling made back in 325 uh, AD, Christian era, before the Council of Nicaea even got going. And that's the whole premise of the council. Everybody had a single vote from whatever bisphoric they came from. Now, uh, let's take a look at what the decision was, just so we're clear. It's going to flip that priority of the book of James coming at the beginning and not the epistles of Paul. Let's listen. Of the New Testament, four books of the Gospels, one of the book of Acts, 13 epistles of Paul. See, now he's in first position. What was the what was Alexandria in 365? We showed you previously that Athanasius had, right after John and Acts, then the epistles called Catholic, seven, James, Peter, John, Jude. See, that's what the priority was prior to this time, and that's a big deal. That's likely what Hippo actually first did. So we don't know, though, no records. All we know is what happened at Carthage, which claimed to be adopting the books, but not necessarily the same order that was used at Hippo. And I believe the likely order had been 
James first, even with Augustine, because when you read Augustine's book, Faith and Works, you'd see why he believes James has a priority over Paul. And he definitely makes that clear, saying James and Jude and Second Peter correct Paul on his doctrines. See, So we'll get to that in another episode. And that's important, though, in canon formation, what order of the books they were, because whatever comes first is usually considered more authoritative than what comes later, just to, so you know how it works in that. Now, Athanasius was the oldest order of the books when they were finally put together in this conjunction, not just the Gospels, but then you would have what came after that, the epistles, even though they're in secondary position uh, in terms of inspiration. This is what Wikipedia New Testament book order says. The order in which the books of the New Testament appear differs between some collections and ecclesiastical traditions. In the Latin West, meaning Latin before the Vulgate of 405 AD, the four Gospels were arranged in the following order. Matthew, John, those are two apostles, right? And Luke, non-apostle, but authoritative. Mark, non-apostle, but authoritative. The Syriac Peshitta places the major Catholic epistles, James, Peter, and first John immediately after Acts and before the Pauline epistles. So this is this is a these are major differences, my friends. This is a different version of Christianity that you're seeing. Syriac means, in my view, is that is the likely first church. They were speaking Hebrew. Syriac is a form of Aramaic Aramaic Hebrew. Therefore, this is where the gospels would have first gone and where you get the earliest sense of what they were doing what they believe was most authoritative. So it starts with Matthew and John, then Luke and Mark, and that's it. That's their gospel. And you look, you can see that in the Syriac Sinaiticus of Agnes Lewis. It's only the four gospels. There's no nothing attached, no epistle of James, nothing, nothing about Paul, nothing, just those four gospels. And then Syriac Peshitta of a later time period does the same thing. Uh, and similarly, it will put James, Peter, and John first and before the Pauline epistles. So why? We're going to get into that. Why did Augustine say James, Jude, and the epistle, Second Peter in particular, were all correcting Paul and his doctrine of faith alone? And that's what I'm going to show you. And that proves to you there was no settled canon as to Paul's status even now. And in fact, they wanted to, uh, Augustine did, he wanted to show that Paul was incorrect about something on faith and works. He agreed with him on predestination, but not in faith and works. He believed that James was right, not Paul. And he believed that Peter was right, if you read carefully in the book of Second Peter in particular, chapter two, it's all about people who, who don't hold steadfast to the faith and they fall away and they fall into lawlessness. Same thing in chapter three of chapter three of Second Peter. If you read carefully and all the way to the end to verse 18, you'll see the whole picture. I want to also show you this was the order of the gospels when they were connected for the first time in the about early 300s to the epistles of James, Peter, and the and Pauline epistles. How and what order were they in? Here's what it, you can find in Frederick Henry Scrivener, top scholar, Cambridge, stop, top Protestant scholar, in his book called A Plain Introduction to the Criticism of the New Testament for the Use of the Biblical Student, Cambridge, 1861. And he writes as follows on page 61. Whether copies contain the whole or part of the sacred volume, the general order of the books is the following. Gospels, Acts, Catholic epistles, meaning James, Peter, and so on, Pauline epistles, and the Apocalypse. Wow. Now, this is interesting. A solitary manuscript of the 15th century places the Gospels between the Pauline epistles and the Apocalypse. So Paul comes first in that one. That's that's probably a Marcionite group. Then in the Codex Sinaiticus, which we're all familiar with, and then these other versions, Bodleian, so on and so forth, the Pauline epistles precede the Book of Acts. Okay. All right, now I just want to show you something. It's an article about by William Webster and I want to show you just a couple of his points that are valid. That is that the Roman Catholic Church never made a decision on canon at all that was binding on all of them. Just city councils don't care, don't matter. And what really happens is you've got no decision by the Catholic Church until 1547 after the Protestant Reformation trying to tell us what we have to accept. And they had a whole bunch of other stuff and they changed the order around it. So it's just, my friends, this is a good article for that purpose alone. So I'm just going to read you a couple of portions of it. It says, the argument says that there is no inspired table of contents for the Bible, that we are forced into relying upon tradition to dictate which books belong to the Bible and which books do not. It was the Church of Rome, these apologists alleged, which determined the canon at the Councils of Hippo of 393 and Carthage of 397. It is only due to this that Protestants know what books are inspired and which are not. And of course, we're going to show you, he's going to say exactly what I just told you in the above portions, but with proof. He says this, first of all, the councils of Carthage and Hippo did not establish the canon for the church as a whole. 
The New Catholic Encyclopedia actually affirms the fact that the canon was not officially and authoritatively established for the Western Church until the Council of Trent in the 16th century, 1547, and that even such authority as Pope Gregory the Great rejected the Apocrypha as canonical. Now, the next is a quote from the New Catholic Encyclopedia in their article, The Canon. And this is what it says. This is the Catholic Church's own telling us, Protestants, they haven't made a decision until 1547. Let's read it. According to Catholic doctrine, the proximate criterion of the biblical canon is the infallible decision of the church, meaning themselves, the Roman Catholic Church. This decision by the Roman Catholic Church was not given until rather late in the history of the church at the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent definitively settled the matter of the Old Testament canon. That this had not been done previously is apparent from the uncertainty that persisted up to that time, up to the time of Trent. But they also determined for the first time the New Testament canon, you see? So that's the problem. They never made a decision earlier and they're admitting it here. And of course, you can't point to councils of city councils here in Hippo and here in Carthage. And Webster makes a couple of other good points about going back to Hippo and Carthage. The, there are major fathers in the church prior to the North African councils who rejected the judgment of these councils, such as Oregon, Melito of Sardis, Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem, Gregory of Nassianius, Hilary of Poitiers, Epiphanius, Basil the Great, Jerome, Rufinus, and a host of others. Hippo and Carthage were provincial councils which did not have ecumenical authority. And I just told you why, because that's the decree at Nicaea 325. Nobody has the authority to rule on the canon for anybody else's bishop or city. Okay, so I'm going to have a part two here. Uh, we'll pick up uh, on this episode with the Muratorian canon, the alleged canon. It's actually misnamed, misnamed. It's just a fragment. And we'll look at that in terms of canon. And then when we get to the end of that, I'm also going to then play a clip from a prior video showing you Metzger's conclusion that the Jesus words only canon is the correct principle the early church followed. Jesus words were the only words on par with the law and prophets. And anything in the letter of correspondence was considered not of the same quality. All right. God bless everybody. Take care. Ciao. Bye.